David Garraway is the director of Mississippi State University's Television Center, where he oversees the center's non-athletic broadcast television operations. David has focused on increasing the center's ability to tell creatively engaging stories while both informing and entertaining its target audience. Under his leadership, the center has won many state and regional awards, including two Southeast Emmy nominations. David holds degrees from both the University of Southern Mississippi and Mississippi State University. Hello, I'm David Garraway. And though I'm here to talk to you today about storytelling, for the longest time, I didn't see myself as a storyteller. When I graduated from college in 2003, my degree was in television production. And when I entered my undergraduate program, I had dreams of working live television events, running camera or being in the production truck for sports and other programs. As a result, I focused my attention on the equipment and techniques of production. I was a passable writer. It certainly wasn't my passion, and it definitely wasn't my interest. I wanted to do cool things, not be one of those film kids in the program across the hall. My TV production peers and I would make jokes about the starving artists next door in film production, and I was glad not to be a part of it. But life is funny sometimes, and I wasn't going to get the last laugh. After graduation, I moved into corporate television production, working for a large southeastern regional banking corporation, then managed a small television production facility in South Mississippi before coming to MSU in 2010. The bank and the small facility taught me about the logistics and the business of shoots, for sure, and I felt very prepared to move to the university and help tell our stories here. Fast forward seven years, and I'd hit a creative wall. Though I enjoyed the live production television aspects of my job, I found that my edited work was very formulaic and not very compelling. And if you don't believe me, go take a look at that body of work, still conveniently online for me to face my mediocrity on a fairly regular basis. Now, a couple of years ago, several of us at the TV Center started work on a new production concept that we called MSU Films. In this approach, we really wanted to increase our level of technical and creative proficiency and turn out work that would appeal to larger audiences based solely on the entertainment value of the work. To do this, though, I would have to reassess my understanding of television production and change the way I produced. It was time to turn a very critical eye to my work and determine what I was getting right and what I wasn't. Now, it took working with some very talented producers for me to understand what I had been getting wrong, and I hate to admit that I had some fundamental misunderstandings as to how to handle the creative parts of my profession. So, I'm going to save you a lot of time and trouble and tell you the five things I wish I had known when I started in television. First, and this is arguably the most important, everything is a story, if you dig deep enough. Now, this is the biggest misunderstanding I had while making snide remarks about those filmmakers in college, and I believe it's the thing that most affected the quality of everything I had created for years. I mean, I understand that everyone has a story to tell, but I didn't get how to apply this idea to the more mundane projects that would run across my desk. I mean, how do you possibly incorporate a storyline into a marketing video for a land conservation nonprofit? As I used to see a topic as dry as this, uh, just be another soundbite, soundbite, soundbite video, it seemed as interesting to me as watching grass grow. However, I was fortunate that James Parker, one of our senior producers, was assigned to the project. He fundamentally understood that every project is an opportunity to tell a compelling story. The details are how the story interacts with the client required elements to get the message across. Now take a look at this segment from It's a Journey. My name's uh, Jim Curry. Grew up between New Orleans and past Christian. I 
must have had a desire somewhere to, to, to I must have been attracted to forestry and land and everything because uh, my, my grandfather was a lumber band. Never dreamed that I'd live on my land. I was just putting together and any time something came up for sale next to it, I'd, I'd try to get it and make the parcels a little bigger and what have you. Then Katrina came along and took away our house and uh, after about a year, we said, well, you know, maybe moving up to the farm's not a bad idea. When I got into it, I was kind of a sponge because I really didn't have a background in this stuff. It wasn't until a number of years down the line that I was not seeing the forest because of the trees. It doesn't seem like a marketing video at all, does it? I mean, it certainly holds your attention in a way that a classic marketing piece doesn't. The full film is available on our Vimeo channel, and I encourage you to watch it. But this piece works because James knows something I didn't know, and it's that everything is a story, if you dig deep enough. Now, I thought land conservation video and figured experts would walk us through the whole thing in sound bites, but James saw a different story, a person who has spent their life caring for the land and wanting to make sure that that legacy is continued in perpetuity. Through the creation of this primary character in the documentary, the experts can then be added as secondary characters to provide perspective on how this primary character's experiences are translated to a larger audience. Now, James knew something I didn't, because when I went to school to work in TV, I was thinking about the tools and not the content. But he got it. Everything we do can be told as a story. There's always a setup, there's always conflict, and there's always resolution. The sooner we embrace storytelling as the foundation of the work we do, the sooner we can be successful at creating compelling content. So here I am, 20 years later, learning what the film kids learned at the start of the millennium. Now the second thing I wish I had known is don't be afraid of silence in storytelling. Now you might have noticed that in the segment I showed a moment ago, but here's another. Lord, we come to you again today asking for safety, happiness, if it's in your will, a bountiful catch. Uh, safe return for everyone today. And uh, while we're out here, please watch over our friends, family, loved ones, even our enemies. Thank you, Lord. Amen. My name is Sonny Schindler. I'm an owner and guide for Shore Thing Fishing Charters in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Again. I came from a background where I was taught that time was a premium and that projects needed to move quickly in order to stay within the audience's attention span. Now, it made sense to me at the time, but I realize now that I had the formula backwards. Videos aren't short to fit an audience's attention spans. Audiences' attention spans are short because most of the time, the video isn't compelling enough to hold their attention. Now, this has been an eye-opener for me. I found that by slowing down the pacing to let the character and story unfold, the audience not only pays attention, they buy into the story. In the segment you just watched, notice how the environment for the character, Sonny, is set before we ever see him. We see the boats, we hear the engines, and then Sonny says a prayer, something that doesn't advance the concept of land conservation, but does advance him as a character. Now, we're a minute into the video, and you haven't learned one thing about land conservation and its effects on coastal habitat. But I bet you know the type of person that Sonny is, and you're interested in knowing more of his story. And this is why you shouldn't be afraid of the silence in the story. It doesn't inhibit the story. It enhances it. Now, James is going to tell you that I still get too impatient, and I want to tighten everything we edit around here, but I'm learning, and it's a slow process. 
Now, in both of the segments I just played for you, notice how the primary characters aren't giving straight sound bites. Their statements meander and weave. Now, there's a good reason for this, and it's the third thing that I wish I had known. Characters and stories have conversations, not interviews. Now, this realization redefined my interaction with those that we feature in our short docs. I still use the term interview when going somewhere to speak to a project participant. But watching James and others and their approach has taught me that the best thing I can possibly do is steer a conversation, giving the participant as much room as they need to tell their story. Now, I'm an impatient person, so this is diff really difficult for me. But it makes the story so much better. Now, in this clip from The Last Supermarket, we meet one of our characters who provides the audience with a first-hand account of some of the effects of food insecurity in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Now, the easiest thing to do would be to drop in several sound bites and move on, but then you wouldn't know her as a person. Watch how James has created a segment that tells you what you need to know about her without her saying anything about food insecurity. My name is Lanelle Stewart. I'm a person that I love to cook, so I love to shop for food. And I'm always looking at for something different. I like to experiment with dishes. You know, I might say, well, you know what, I want to see what can I do to this chicken today to make it different from what I had two days ago or whatever, so I just love to, to flip recipes around, add my own touch. I love hot food. You know, I mean, when I say hot, I mean with spices, hot with spices. And I use all, any herb there is, I probably have it in my kitchen. Maybe I might be missing something, but not many, not many. I've mostly been cooking my whole life. I worked in a restaurant and uh, for 42 years, so I learned to cook there. Of course, I had a lot of errors, so I just kept practicing and practicing until I got it to where I want. And I just love to cook for my family. Do you think cooking is kind of a tradition around here? Like, cooking is a big part of this area? Yes. We are home, homebodies, so to speak. You lo we love to cook at home, you know, like to feed our families at home. We like to sit down with our families and have a meal, home-cooked meal. None of that was possible through the exclusive use of a sit-down interview. James was smart enough to spend time with her and follow her through a daily routine, letting her talk about herself and what she does in the kitchen and why she does it. This conversation has painted a framework of Linnell as a character in the story. Now, when we go to her for first-hand accounts on food insecurity, we understand her experiences within this framework that's been painted at the front of the piece. You don't get this with a sit-down interview, and it means you, as a producer, must be genuinely interested in the people who participate in your projects. Does it take longer? Absolutely. But the difference is significant. Approaching every interaction with project participants creates conversational approaches that enhance the story you want to tell. Now, even within these conversations, though, you will have to ask your participants to answer some questions, which brings me to the fourth thing I wish I had known. Enjoy the uncomfortable pause. Now, it's no secret that we, as a society, hate uncomfortable pauses and will do anything to eliminate them. With that in mind, you can use this to your advantage. And I love this one because it's so deceptively obvious and easy to implement. After you've asked a question of your participant and they've finished answering, pause. Just a little longer than it feels comfortable to you. Sometimes your participant will fill this space by continuing their response. And I've found that this is almost always the most genuine and human part of their answer. All because we hate silence. Now, on a related note, my favorite question is now the one I always ask at the end. What haven't I asked you that you want to tell me? 
Inevitably, I've missed some angle in my pre-production and interview preparation. And this is the place where the participant gets to fill me in. And this works for a couple of reasons. First, there's no possible way, even with your prep work, to possibly know every angle that your project participant can provide. It's likely there's an entire avenue of discussion that you failed to plan for, that your participant was expecting and ready to discuss. Second, the participant was waiting for you to ask a, a specific question a specific way, and you, I, didn't. This is the opportunity for them to tell you the thing they want to tell you, and that earnestness comes through in their answer. And trust me on this one. So, four things I wish I had known when I would started in this business eons ago. Everything is a story. Don't be afraid of silence. It's a conversation and not an interview and enjoy the uncomfortable pause. Now this brings us to the fifth thing I wish I had known. It's not the story you think it is. Stop trying to shoehorn your preconceived notion of the story into a framework you manufactured from clip phrases and assembled sound bites. When I say you, of course, I mean me. I'll be honest, I've spent a lot of my time in this industry as an assembly line editor. I can crank out mediocre work all day long and I'm very efficient at it but I wasn't telling the stories with the product. The reason is that I made the content fit my story, rather than allowing the story to play out in a natural way. Now to solve this, I had to let go to some extent. Rather than walk into a production with a rigid framework, I had to set up mileposts and find ways to guide the stories past each, but ultimately let each story take its own route. Back to those conversation, conservation films we saw earlier. The conversations with each of the primary characters determined how the supplemental conversations with experts were used. We looked at the story we had, then determined how much of the client's criteria were met within the story, and not the other way around. In short, I had to reverse the way I was thinking. And the credit to James, he made it happen, and show me how. Now, since we began the MSU Films initiative, I have developed a greater appreciation for the craft those film kids were invested in all those years ago. And I grudgingly admit that maybe they were, in fact, not just starving artists. I'm becoming more confident in my ability to understand how a story develops and how to nurture its development. Listening to others, including the incredibly talented professionals with whom I work every day, has been a key to that confidence. I have little doubt that the five things I wish I had known is not an exhaustive list. With every project, I try to find something that will make the next one a little better. So I wish you the best in your storytelling, regardless of the kind you create. Thanks for your time today, and hail state.